Hey, uh, I'm Prabal. I am one of the co-founders of Avail. Uh, in Avail, we are building a data availability-focused blockchain. We will talk a little bit about what Avail is and so on, and then talk a little bit about how we use Lip peer to peer um, Of course, we will not, I, I am not uh, uh, well knowledgeable enough to go into the details of how we are using Lip peer to peer Our engineers have not been able to attend this particular session this time, but uh, I will just try to go on over the overarching details of how we utilize them. So the brief agenda is like we will introduce a veil and then go through the high level concepts of what is literature coding, how data will sampling works, the logical separation that we have done, and then why we transform from IPFS to Catamlia, and then go through some of the core protocols like uh, the data will sampling on light clients, the application clients, application specific uh, data retrieval, and so on and so forth, and then some of the optimizations. Uh, so this, I will make this thing quick. I think uh, Wondertan has done an amazing, amazing job of uh, explaining what is data availability and how they utilize it in Celestia. And I see all of you, many of you have also used Celestia, so might be you guys already know this. But just for you know, uh, having the uh, same uh, starting point, like it's a modular blockchain focused on data availability. We do only transaction ordering and publication. It's uh, data and execution agnostic, so it doesn't matter what kind of execution engine you use. You can use EVM, WASM, any other uh, very sophisticated uh, mechanism for uh, defining the state transition of your, of the execution environment of your choice. And it supports any type of proof systems like zero-knowledge proofs, optimistic uh, validiums, and such. Um, how we build it, it's, uh, it's based on Substrate. Uh, we use that as the base layer, so the entire stack is built on Rust, uh, starting from the blockchain node to the light clients. The light client is mainly used for data will sampling and making sure that we can ask every user of any of the chains which are running on a veil to have the same level of security as if they are running a full node. And uh, yeah, and then we use the Rust version of the lip to peer for the networking stack. Uh, let's go through the high-level concepts. Mm, pretty simple. How we do it is like uh, we use polynomial commitments, especially KZG polynomial commitments here. So what we do is we take the entire data that is uh, pushed as part of the blobs to avail. We map them out into a 2D matrix. This uh, particular matrix is used uh, to encode the data into a succinct representation, which is the commitment here. The commitments are generated row-wise, so you take them row by row, you generate polynomial commitments on each of these rows, and then you keep them in the header. But at the same time, to create redundancy, we need erasure coding, so that means that we have to, uh, we have to also encode it and do it in polynomial interpolation form. So what we do is we do that column-wise, we take each of these columns and erasure code it to, to extend the data. Right now we use uh, double the size of it. Um, one of the major properties of KZG commitments that helps us is the homomorphic property of it, which means that the commitments can be uh, extended without having to extend all of the data. So what you can do is you can generate the commitments, uh, erasure code it to extend it to all the 2N commitments, and then you will be done because that's having the same effect as uh, generating each of these columns column by column and then and, like committing to each one of the extended rows. So yeah, it's pretty simple, uh, split it into M and cross N metrics. Each of the cells are 32 uh, bytes long. This is the requirement for BLS 12381 that we use. Uh, the original matrix is then extended to 2M cross N. Uh, in general, how the, how the main blockchain works is that the data gets extended, then it gets propagated and committed into these headers. The headers are then submitted to and propagated to the entire network of full nodes. The full nodes uh, basically check that the, each of the extensions were correct, the headers were co constructed correctly, so we can have up to 1,000 validators. All of them check this, and then the validator, they finalize these blocks. These blocks go out to uh, the entire network, but only the headers go to the light clients. So yeah, uh, not going into too many details, but going to the meat of it, which is data available sampling. In data available sampling, all of these blocks, the they, bits and pieces of it are sampled by this light client network, and this is where we need the lip peer to peer and the Kademlia DHT implementation of it. So what we do here is that all of these bits and pieces, uh, each, of the, uh, each of the light client sample may be 10 to 30 of these samples. These samples are then uh, kept on the, their DHT, 
and in a, in a, in such a way such that the light clients together keep the entirety of the data and beyond so the main intention is to make it extremely hard for uh, even the validators to suppress the amount of data that that is there on on this network so the light clients what they do is they, they perform the sampling in in an effect to uh, understand themselves that the data is available but at the same time keep it available for the rest of the network as well so yeah uh, all of the like the DAS is performed on every block. The a number of cells, uh, random cells, are retrieved, and it's verified against the commitment. So, as I showed you, the commitments, the commitments help us to verify that the that the particular cell belongs at that particular position inside my block without having to rely on, let's say, fraud proofs or such in Merkle-based constructions. Yep, and we did some kind of logical separation. What is that? That the nodes, they generate uh, proofs for the requested cells. The cells are 32 bytes of padded data because the BLS 381, as I mentioned, and 48 bytes of proof, which is the elliptic curve points here. So in together, they provide these 80 bytes of cells. And the, that's why what we have done is we have then separated the uh, a logical separation in the client, which is the light client, which is responsible for data availability sampling. But at the same time, we have an app client which uh, reconstructs the data for a given application ID. So in, in when we started off, and we started off around 2020 and 2021, we had a basic POC, late 2021, we started with the peer-to-peer -peer implementation. Uh, we, we initially started with IPFS because it works best. We can work with high-level abstractions. And what we did is we entirety of the blocks were delivered through the peer-to-peer -peer network. Now, the cells were encoded as part of the columns, and the columns were encoded as part of the blocks. That's the IPLD uh, format that we used. But uh, this approach seemed to be not working for us uh, because it was inefficient in terms of the random sampling that we wanted to do as part of the every cell that we wanted to uh, do like for retrieval. And from that, what we did is like we, we wanted to go one level down. We wanted to like use the Canemdia DHT directly. And the network traffic hence decreased. Uh, the needed cells can be can be pinpointed by a particular index and then be downloaded. The in-memory store decreased. Uh, we didn't have to you know, keep the entirety of the columns. We just needed a few cells. Uh, what we do with the data value sampling, we receive the block header from the node. We calculate a, a, a definite random number of cells uh, up to a cert certain confidence threshold that how much confidence do we want to have that the data is available. Based on that, we do a probabilistic sampling here, and then uh, we try to retrieve the cells from the Kademlia DHT. If it fails, because it can happen, as we have discussed from the morning, there are it's a work in progress, there, there are times when it doesn't work, even if uh, the nodes are connected to the DHT, it just doesn't seem to be able to communicate with each other. If things are behind NAT, we keep having issues and so on and so forth. So we have the fallback that the, that the data can be retrieved from the RPC if it is not available. And for that, what we do is like only the cells which are not available on the DHT are fetched from the RPC and then also kept on the DHT so that at all times the DHT is always uh, populated and from there anyone can retrieve up to a threshold of the cells. Yeah, and uh, the light clients, they compute the block confidence, as I mentioned. Uh, the delta is uploaded to the, RP, uh, for, to the, to, to the DHT, and then uh, they signal the application client that the block has been verified. Now, what does this application clients do? Basically, we want to uh, make sure that these, these base, base chains, they keep the data for multiple rollups. And these rollups, they want to have a particular application ID against which they submit the data. Otherwise, they will, to retrieve the entirety of the data, they would have to you know, download the full block. To, in order to avoid that, what we do is we create a unique ID, and the app clients reconstruct the application data, uh, but they cannot just download all the cells because they can do it, but potentially it can be a large amount of cells. So to keep things in perspective, we have around 64,000 cells per block. So those many entries need to hit the DHT, which can be a bit of a problem if you want to download a host of them onto a single client. And that's why what we do is we store the row-wise data, uh, which is verified by the commitment checks. 
so the, if the commitment checks out, that's great. You just proceed with data reconstruction, which you can do because it's erasure coded, which means that even a small subsample of the cells can be used to reconstruct the entire, entirety of the data. But at the same time, if you do not get it, you can always have a fallback to download it cell by cell. Of course, from, from the DHT first and then the RPC. So yeah, I mean, uh, don't want to repeat too much of this because this is a lightning talk. I don't want to take too much of your time. But if, uh, if the second fails, which is downloading the missing rows, then it goes to individual cells. If it can retrieve more than 50%, great, then it can reconstruct the original data. In terms of the implementation challenges and the things that we worked on till now, um, what, we, what we essentially wanted to do is we wanted to rely completely on the DHT, because that we would want to, to be a source of our truth. Uh, but at the same time, Given that the network can be a bit sporadic at times, it can also be inconsistent, uh, firewalls, uh, NAT, uh, types of connection, TCP, UDP, uh, IPv6, IPv4, I think you guys know. Uh, it can be a bit inconsistent, and that's why we always have to have a fallback on the RPCs, which we would want to typically avoid. Because we don't want a network which is, again, centralized by these full nodes, where you know the centralized RPC providers of the world, then again, uh, they are the they are the gateways to getting to ac getting an access to the blockchain. Now, on our internal stress testing, we have some interesting findings. Uh, the main challenge was just delivering all the cells onto the DHT inside a block time. For context, we have a 20-second block time, which is fairly liberal. But at the same time, we don't have the liberty to utilize the entirety of the 20 second to just upload cells into the DHT, right? Um, so at that point in time, we saw that the connection overhead became dominant factor rather than the IO or anything else. Uh, just parallelly opening these, much amount, these many uh, connections became a problem. Even downloading uh, a huge number of cells became very much CPU bound. So huge number of very small data chunks, probably that is not what it was meant to handle. Maybe not, you guys can say more. Um, but at the same time, just handling the, uh, like the stream multiplexing and the connections became an became a issue. And that's why we are going on fine tuning the Cadendia parameters to kind of you know, further optimize this. We are trying to down, like basically be up to date with upstream because we see a lot of work that is being happening on the Rust peer-to-peer -peer implementation and so on and so forth. So we saw that reducing the replication factor speeds up cell delivery, which seems uh, natural right now, but it was not that obvious when we started. Uh, in or also like raising the maximum record size to uh, to something like say 8 KB, uh, they had no performance penalties, so we can uh, you know have more kind of uh, bigger sizes of payloads. And then it was uh, like the default memory allocator uh, never deallocated, and these kind of you know increase the memory consumption and so on and so forth. So yeah, what we are trying to right now test out is like when we switched from TCP to Quick, we saw significant like increase in performance, but at the same time there were uh, not uh, performance only but stability. Uh, we were seeing some issues, maybe with, with our testing platform, but that's what we are testing out right now. Um, we have replaced the uh, Rust allocator, the default Rust allocator with Gemalloc, and that allowed for a smaller memory footprint. But uh, this comes from the network side, uh, but at the same time, we are also trying to push the cryptography side of it. What we are trying to do is we are trying to compose a lot of these openings uh, the, the openings are the proofs against the polynomial commitments that we use. What we are trying to do is we are trying to compose a multiple of these openings together to create a small multi-proof. That's the polynomial multi-proof design that we have. What that allows is that you don't have to retrieve cells individually. You can basically have a batch request for a significant subgrid of the entire data. And that coalescing factor has made like things faster. We are trying it out right now in our incentivized test net and so on and so forth. So yeah, I would be happy to, you know, if you guys test it out and let us know. Yeah, that's almost all. Thanks a lot. Any questions? Oh, yeah, here we go, Andrew.
actually have a bunch of questions. Um, the first one is, what's the throughput right now? What's like um, the block size, and how big is the square? Or um, with uh, if you only if cells are only thirty two bytes. Yeah, we have around uh, two fifty six cos two fifty six is the grid size, which is uh, double to two fifty six cos five hundred twelve, which is almost four MB of data. Four megabytes. Four megabytes. Okay. Um, the second sort of a question or like discussion points, like I'm, I'm again curious on a decision of using DHT in the first place, Academia particularly, because we also are considering using that uh, in the first place. But then we were thinking about like how currently it works, as far as I understand your um, protocol, is that you disperse the cells uh, to like clients over DHT. Which means that like like clients had to receive the inbound connections, which no, is so, so the light clients they sample it so they request the cells that they want. We do not want to disperse them. Uh, what we have is like after the block gets finalized, a host of light clients start sampling the data, and in the beginning we want to bootstrap the peer to peer with uh, all the cells being sampled. But later on, the light clients can be self-sufficient only on relying on the DHT. Okay, so like you store provider records not on light clients or some full other full nodes, and then okay, light client sample for that. Okay, makes sense. Um, I don't have any more questions. Would be happy to chat later. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and, uh, well, I'm passing you on. Just to be clear, you you have spun up your own DHT instance. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. You're not using the Amino DHT. Cool. Um, yeah, basically following up on that, um, what was uh, what was it that was not suitable to use the IBFS DHT and forced kind of uh, another um, going to another building another network? So uh, right now the IBFS DHT is very um, like like there are there are a few things which didn't match. For example, that is content addressed, which is great. So mm -hmm. you have the content and then you address it by the content, right? So the hash of the content is the address. But for a light client to sample, they do not know the hash, right? Because we are not a hash-based construction. We are more of a polynomial commitment-based construction. So what we need is we need to index, we need to address it by the index. And that's why like content addressable doesn't make, like cut it for us. Uh, that's why we had to make manual DHT entries as per the index and then hash the index to make that the address of the content that we want. Roughly makes sense, no? Yeah, it does. I need to think about it, but yeah, thank you. And there were other issues, of course, like with IPFS, I think uh, we, we really tried to do it in the first, uh, but we recognize that it is probably for a larger chunk of data and a fewer amount of data. Uh, like fewer entries, larger chunks. Whereas if you see our design, it's more like 80 bytes per entry, but many of these entries. And again, with IPLD, we had done it, for example, column-wise, but then the light client overhead was high because they had to download this entire column and then sift through it to find the exact cell and so on and so forth. So again, uh, we, we wanted to use that level of abstraction because of course, uh, who wants to tune uh, leap repair parameters, uh, no one. But um, at the end, uh, we realized that we do have to go one level deeper in order to make this more suitable and basically custom for us, so to say. I think we have one more question. Um, thanks a lot for the presentation. Uh, the question is about uh, applications you mentioned. Uh, uh, does it mean that um, uh, information for a particular application is stored uh, across the entire network? It's a subcluster of nodes that contains uh, information for a particular app ID? Not really. I mean, that is definitely an optimization that we want to do later because the construction here allows for those kind of optimizations. Let me just... Yeah, so what this allows is you can have the column-wise uh, subset of like a node keeping only a single column. Because if they're responsible for a particular column, then the indexing becomes much easier. Because if you see that the index is actually the, the position in your row. If you have a position in your row, 
you can then apply much better uh, batching proofs where basically you take multiple polynomials, but you all open up at the same index. So there are batching techniques which allows us to kind of take a, a, a host of these uh, proof openings and then combine them to form a single multi-proof opening. But at this, at this point in time, we have not opened up that can of worms, so to say, because with optimizations comes other challenges. For example, uh, those kind of constructions require um, require G2 points, more number of G2 points from the SRS, and, and it relies on the pairing a lot more. It needs much more pairing checks and so on and so forth. Again, happy to discuss them further, but at, the, at this point in time, we, we want to keep things extremely simple. We want to stress test it at the extreme to know what the bottlenecks are before going for optimizations as, as that, if that makes sense. But at this point, everyone keeps all the data to answer your question. Uh, okay, actually, uh, it seems like great, uh, like more natural, I guess. Uh, is data held uh, forever or uh, for some period of time on a, on a chain? Uh, I mean, in a while. Can, can, you, can you repeat it? Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, is uh, the data held forever? Uh, no. No. Oh. So, of course, like uh, I, I was discussing this yesterday in a panel, but uh, right now the tooling is not enough for us to say that we will delete the data and you go figure. Uh, that will not be the good approach for the rollups which are building on top. So, of course, initially we will keep the data for some amount of time. Again, that is undecided. Uh, maybe we have like initial set of data, but over time, of course, this this amount of data, like I, like we cannot sustain a network logically which submits 2 MB per 20 second forever. That is probably not possible for us. So this is a data availability and it's, it's very different from something like data storage and things like that. So what we are trying to do right now is that once the data comes in, we keep it, keep it available for a short period of time, but we have partners who are taking this data and putting it to IPFS, who are then pinning it to kind of IPFS to make sure like things like Filecoin and RV and so on and so forth. What they then do is like, that is the long-term storage that gets available for the rollup. But this particular construction will only keep it for let's say a month or whatever the challenge period of the optimistic and the validity proof design uh, utility, like the wallets need to reconstruct the account nonsense and so on and so forth in a ZK construction. So to efficiently, make sure that the liveness or safety of the rollups which are working on top is not compromised. We will keep it for, for that long, but no longer. Yeah, thanks. It's like blobs, uh, uh, so yeah, reasoning yeah. is uh, understandable. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, thank you for sharing. Good stuff. Thank you.